to our, our next, uh, I'd like to introduce someone who's going to introduce our next presenter. Um, my dear friend uh, from Arkansas, time after time. She's been the executive director for three years. She's a great advocate, uh, does a lot of work there in Arkansas, uh, a very lovely lady, makes every conference every year, uh, Carla Swanson. Good morning. If y'all remember me from yesterday, you're in for another surprise. <laughs> uh, you have his bio, so I'm not going to read it because I would screw it up anyway. Uh, but I did talk to Paul and found out, just like the rest of us, we hate walls. And we have walls built up around us that the government has put there, making life harder for us to do the things that we really want to do, you know, get on with our lives. We have the opportunity for a job. We're great at this particular job. We can't get that job. We can't pass a background check. So there goes that. Uh, you know, you want to live in this house. You have the house. You own the house. You can't. There's a church next door. Another wall. International travel. Something Paul would really like to do. He can't. There's a wall. So Paul has looked into it. He's got some ideas. He needs a team. He needs some more ideas. He needs some people to help. And that's what he's going to be talking about, is maybe how to bring down this wall. Paul, take well, it thank over. Thank you very much. What I'd like to do is actually, I'm going to go through the other session. So just go through the slides, read them. I'll come back in time for questions. No, I can't do that. But the other thing is, uh, based upon how this goes, uh, take good notes and then you can show the video if you have friends who have problems with insomnia. So it should be good for that. <laughs> because unfortunately, this is a very detailed thing and I think it's important to get information out. First of all, I do travel a lot internationally, some with success, great success, others with problems. And as a lot of us who have traveled realize that we're having more and more problems. And we each kind of have tried to attack it individually and it's now to, time to attack it collectively. Um, and there's some gentlemen who have traveled internationally and I want them to be, like Robert here, um, I want them to be actively involved in the discussions that we have after this, not after this, but when we get to the questions. Because I really want, as we get the information out and get through uh, my, my um, briefing, I want everyone to wake up for the questions and we, I'd like to have a robust question and answer period so we can clear up some of the misconceptions uh, and then kind of get on with, with what we need to do. Uh, there is one gentleman I was talking to, one of the things that I didn't think about covering but we do need to cover and that is uh, people, uh, men and women I suppose, who uh, either have married or have spouses who live overseas. He's from the, his spouse is in the Philippines and I forget his name, but that's an issue that's part of this. You, uh, you meet someone overseas, you have a, you're married overseas, you may have lived overseas, and you're trying to bring that spouse to the States to get a visa. And to protect that spouse, it becomes very difficult to bring that spouse into our country because of you being a registrant or a previous registrant. And I'd like to be, have that as part of this, this effort. Is that guy here? Um, I, I met him and I, I guess he couldn't make it. So unfortunately, uh, we, we probably won't be able to cover that issue because I, I have no direct experience of it, so I can't speak to it. Okay, uh, and what's, what's your name, sir, again? Mac. Mac, okay, Mac is a guy who's traveled international a lot. Robert has, I have, uh, and we'll get to the questions and answer period. I wanna, I wanna have a robust discussion on that. Uh, the things that I wanna talk about as far as the agenda is, um, Everyone is aware of the International Megan's Law to prevent demand for child sex trafficking. It passed uh, last uh, June. I'm going to talk about that, what it says, what it is, and what it isn't. Um, I want to get kind of in the de details of it because um, I don't believe that this bill in and of itself is going to affect us directly at the moment because we're already having challenges. They're already doing what this law uh, establishes already. Uh, however, within the meat of it, there's a lot of discussion of process. 
And one of the things I find frustrating is people get to a country, uh, they get off the airplane, their family mood goes on, and they go home. And they're asking why. Well, one of the keys to understanding that is the process. What does the government have in process that is affecting these not notices that get to the foreign country that now the foreign country has got to make a decision whether they're going to let this individual into the country or not. Uh, and no one tells you. So knowledge and information is power. So I want to go to the details of this bill because it discusses that directly. Then we'll get into the current notification process. We'll talk about the players. That I, and I want everyone to understand who is ICE and what are they doing? What is the Marshal Service doing? What is the embassy doing? What are the ICE representatives doing? No one, no one knows who these people are. There's a lot of data out there and a lot of anecdotal information, but exactly what is the architecture look like and what is the information flow look like? So I've gathered a lot of information. Uh, Robert has a lot of the details too. People have shared information. I've found the documents that the government has, at least how they supposedly work the process. I got a form um, that um, they send to the marshal service that Robert shared with me. I don't have a copy of that form, it's really de detailed, but I got a lot of good information off of that. So I want everyone to understand who the players are uh, because they're the ones implementing the process and that's one of the places that we can attack. Then uh, we'll go over the notification architecture, kind of how's the information flowing, and then talk uh, in general, educate people on the Interpol green notices uh, then I want to kind of go down the country. I don't want to get buried in the detail of each country, but get educate people on the countries that we've had problems with recently and over the last couple of years and why. And then um, I want to talk about an action plan and an action team that I hope we can put together. And then, then I'd like to go into questions. Now, I don't think there's any problem with someone asking a question and we answer the question, but I want to get through this stuff first before we get into a detailed discussion, okay? And I'd like to try to do all this in about probably two and a half to three hours if we can. Uh, <laughs> it's really dry, I'm sorry, it just, it just is. So let's uh, get into it, okay. So the International Megan's Law to Prevent Demand for Child Sex Trafficking. First of all, we understand that it will do nothing to affect uh, child sex trafficking, nothing because they put resources into regist registrants who are already traveling. So it's not going to do anything to individuals who travel. Now let me give you an anecdotal example. I went to the Philippines and on my flight from um, Dubai to Manila, I sat by this guy. I was upgraded first class, I'm not sure why, but I took it. And this guy, we just chatted and about 30 minutes before he landed, he lives in Bali. And again, this is just hearsay and I don't want to get into details of it, but he said he was a group of guys who lived in Asia, and they often, he says, it's great Philippines, you can get meet underage prostitutes. And he told me that that's what him and a bunch of guys do. And I went, I, I tried to ignore the conversation, and then I just went on my way. Well, I, when I got to immigration, I got pulled aside, and the Filipinos said, we're sending you home. But when I got back to Dallas, I was met there by uh, Homeland Defense. They're asking me, well, we got to go through your stuff because you got rejected. I said, I never even got in the Philippines. I was there for like three hours. So, but they went through my stuff. They gave me a colonoscopy and then they <laughs> chatted with me. And then they said, okay, fine, you know, go on your way. But then I told them, I said, you need to know about this. So I, I didn't remember the guy's name, but I mentioned what this guy said and he was sitting next to me. So here's an example of the word about me, but there are traffickers right now living in Asia, living in other places who are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and they're worried about us. That's a perfect example. So if anything, if we can, if we can emphasize you're wasting your resources, this is, will not, this is putting children in harm, because the resource is over here, and these other guys are doing it over here. And we, all, we already know, I saw one record that 98% of child exportations happening is from people who have never been caught. So you're wasting your time. You're putting children at risk. So I think that's a spin that we need to emphasize when we go into some legislative action. Now that's anecdotal, but I'm sure we can pack it up with data as we do some research. Okay, so what is this law gonna do? First of all, it passed on, a, on May 20th. 
uh, uh, Representative Smith, I think from New Jersey, is the one that has pushed it. Uh, it now sits at, at the legislative uh, calendar. Now, what's it going to do? The emphasis is providing advance notice of intended travel of registered of registrants outside the U.S. to requesting foreign countries. The main thing it, it establishes and formalizes within ICE a center called the Angel Watch Center. Now that center exists as it is. It already exists. Uh, now I saw a report that it has, it's a one-man team. I don't know if that's true. Do, Robert, do you know what it constitutes there? No. Okay, and if I state anything and anyone who knows that you have more information on what I have, please speak up, okay? So if someone knows more about the Angel Watch programs, one person had actually phoned and talked to an individual in that office, which is good information. So please go ahead and speak up. Yeah, and turn off all your devices. <laughs> or so you can give this speech, I'll go to the bathroom, no. Um, re uh, receive information on travel of sex offenders. One of the objectives is that they want to encourage other countries to reciprocate. Well, except for Australia and Canada and a few others, they, I don't think they care. You know, maybe England, but other countries aren't going to care. But that's one of the stated objectives of, the, of, the, uh, of it. Uh, establish a system to maintain archive uh, information. So what the center is going to do, it's going to gather information and start archiving it. So one thing I can see, and they're probably doing it to some extent now, is they're going to start documenting our travel experiences uh, and use that from an intelligence point of view. Now that can be good, that can be bad. If you're not doing anything wrong, I don't see that as bad. Unless, like I go to the Caribbean a lot, unless they say that suggests a pattern of travel that we're gonna send more notices. The problem is right now, from what I can perceive is, when they have the data, they're sending the notice, regardless of any consideration for risk level or possibility that you're out to do something nefarious. Uh, it's gonna establish an annual review process, that doesn't really matter. Uh, and for the Marshal Service, it, the National Sex Offender Tracking Office has already exists, but it's going to allow procedures for the Marshal Service to make sure they get information to the Angel Watch Service. Now, everything I just said is already occurring. So the question is, what does this law do? Now, in co casual conversations, what it does is it codifies what they're already doing in procedure. So the, so the risk for us who want to attack this from a legislative point of view is that um, it, it's a different to attack process than attack, attack something that's law. So I, I'm not saying that the passing this law is not going to be a bad thing, um, but the problem is if we can attack it before it becomes law and affect process, I think that has an advantage. But that comes down to the team we make and whatever action items we decide to proceed with. Okay, so the establishment of the office then establishes procedure for notification. To the destination countries, uh, the Senate will transmit a notice of impending and current international travel. And I'll show you where it gets its data information, how they flow the information. Uh, and then there's a form uh, under this paragraph, may be, a form may be transmitted, uh, such as means as determined by the office. And one of the things I want to do is try to get copies of the green notices, but also the notices that the Angel Watch Center sends to the ICE office in the appropriate embassy, who then notifies the other country. Go ahead. Um, you say that she sent notices of child sex offenders. How do they know if you are someone in their offender as a child versus... It's all based upon the offense of what you have on the registry. Okay. So those and then those are pretty, you know... if conviction. Correct. But what they're doing now, they're sending information on any SO. They're, they're not making any distinction at all, as far as we know. Now, um, there, one of the things we're going to do is to have a Freedom of Information Act request to try to get all the data we can. Copies of forms, copy of processes, whatever we can get from the government released. So at least we can understand what's going on. One of the things that I've been frustrated with is you have a lot of anecdotal information. You go, first of all, a great source of information I think a lot of you know is the California RSOL site, that is superb. They, at least from current information, and there's a gentleman on there, I want to be on the team, I can't remember his name. He's, he, he, I think he's a lawyer, he has a lot of blog entries on international travel. But, but just from gathering information and getting blog uh, information, uh, the California RSOL website is excellent. 
and I want to emulate a lot of what they're doing. Uh, more, yeah, I know Janice, you know, Pat Janice on the Mac, Superwoman, fine, fine. And Mary Sue, she's Superwoman too. <laughs> the crazy person, right. Um, okay, so now two offenders. This is very important to us. Uh, what they're going to do, what they're supposed to do is try, according to this law, is try to make efforts to notify us by electronic means, and that would be phone call or email, that they've notified the other country. Now, that's, this is not happening right. at all. It's not happening. They're not even making any effort. Now, uh, in discussions with some people, uh, it suggested that there was some pushback probably in closed sessions that, well, what about these guys going out there? They're kind of like, you know, naked in the wind. I mean, metaphor. But they're, maybe that's why they're, you know, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Well, of course, they're sex offenders. Uh, but, you know, they're out there with no information. So that was maybe thrown in. And, they, and the way it's written is they're supposed to make every means possible to notify the, the SO. The other thing is, if you're going to be ejected by the country, they're supposed to make every effort to no tell you of that fact. So at least you have that information and you can choose to go on with your trip or not. They're not doing that. And the last thing, which I think is really chilling, and I want to really go over this, Section B, specific notification regarding risk to life or well-being of the offender. Now, this is really chilling. If the center has reason to believe that the transmission notice poses a risk of life or well-being to, to the uh, registrant, the offender shall make, the center shall make reasonable efforts to let us know. So the same reasonable efforts that they're Yes, 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 yes. And and we, we've noticed that there's no effort at all. So so we already know, and this this may be something we can tack from a legal point of view. We know that they believe that this process has a reasonable chance that offenders, American citizens, will be traveling abroad who've done nothing wrong and are not even under suspicion of and doing anything wrong, because I'll tell you how in fact, they, they, have, they deal with offenders who have, are on suspicion that you're going to go overseas and maybe get beat up, maybe be killed, uh, you're well beat, you're physical, and they know that. They're passing along. That, that's stated right there. To me, that's absurd. How can you, you know, how, how is that justified at all? It's like that was just thrown, well, we'll let them know. Reasonable effort. To me, that's outrageous. So that's an effort where we can tack legally, it seems to me. Um, and then specific notification of probable denial, I've already mentioned that. Um, so that is basically what, um, what, go ahead. Uh, Paul, I just wanted to know, is, so we have this bill that's being proposed. Correct. It's, it's, and it's passed. Are these what are actually, is actually in effect now, or what are the restrictions that are actually in effect? Okay, in effect right now, and, and this gets down to when we get the anecdotal stuff is, when you travel, and I'll show it in the architecture. You, when you go down to your agency and you tell them that you're traveling internationally, if you abide, if your state abides by Adam Walsh, then they are supposed to tell you, you have to tell them within 21 days of leaving that you're traveling internationally. They fill, fill, fill out a fairly detailed information about your itinerary, et cetera. They pass that to the marshal service and then Marshal Service makes a determination whether they're going to pass that on to Interpol. Then Interpol makes a decision whether they pass that on with a green notice to the receiving country. The second method is that when you book your flight, there's two systems. One is called the name record computer system, and the other one is the airline passenger information system. Now, obviously, the Angel Watch office has access to that database. So one is when you book your flight online, uh, it goes into a data system, and when you board the flight and swipe your passport, that manifest is released by the airline before the doors are closed, and that goes into the, air, the airline passenger information system, APSIS. So two systems, one is called the name record, the other one is called the airline passenger information system. Both of those systems are accessible by ICE and the Angel Watch office. I don't know exactly how they do it. I don't know if it's an automated alert or they call the data for registrants. It's probably automated. So the Angel Watch will get an alert that from that one of those two databases that there's a traveling registrant. 
then they'll make a decision whether they pass that on to the ICE representative in the country that you're going to. Now, one of the things to realize is not all countries have ICE representatives. There's only probably maybe 30 or 35. There is a website that you can go to uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement website, and if you navigate through it, you can get to a map that shows you where they have representatives. Those representatives are American nationals who are embedded in the embassy, and their job is to deal with all ICE issues in that country. They have the ability to, when they are notified by watch office, to make a decision whether they notify the immigration of the country that you're going to. From there, it goes to the particular immigration or border control agency at the airport that you're arriving in. What website was that? Uh, ICE. I, I, I have it someplace, okay. but it's uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, their website. It might be ICE.org or something like that, or ICE.gov. S C I I C I S. And, oh, is it? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've got, I can email you the website. I don't have it handy. <laughs> yeah. If you just type, yeah, right, right, right. But it's easy to find ICE's website, government website, and it's on that website. Right. And so, like, I go to Jamaica a lot. Well, suddenly, I've been pulled out the last three times in Jamaica, and they interrogate me. I give them my itinerary, and they let me move on. The last time I went, this time, they said, you know, and it, we prefer you need to get off the registry. And really what they were saying is, um, they don't care if I go in, but they, they, want, they want to stop getting these nasty alerts that I'm arriving. That's what they really want. And people have gone to Mexico where dual passports, they've been told very specifically, travel on your Mexican passport, then we don't have to deal with this bullshit. So, so what's happening is messages, really rude messages get to a border agent and these border agents are making a decision. And the, if you don't, they could care. I'm not saying they don't care, but, but they, they wouldn't care. They don't. If they don't get the message, they'll let you in. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's our government sending them messages because they can. So let me go through this because I'm going to get to some of these answers. Is this law not in effect? It is not in effect. It says passed May 20th, 2014. In the House. In the House. Then it goes to the Senate. Then it has to be signed by the President. Go. Oh, shoot. Really? Damn. Okay, let me go, I need to go through this quicker. Um, okay, so, so the, the deal is they're doing this already. They're not notifying us of anything, but they're doing this already through the Angel Watch program. So that's what everyone needs to be, and there's a lot of countries now they're sending messages to. Uh, the question is, will you be turned away? That's something that we could have long discussions of, but let me get through this. This is important. It's a little bit detailed, but people have to understand who the players are. Um, there is the uh, DOJ uh, Smart Office. Uh, a lot of people hear Smart Office thrown around. They provide guidance and technical assistance to jurisdictions to deal with registration issues. The Marshal Service is the one that gets a lot of data from their registering agency. And they, uh, as Robert knows especially, he's, he's in a sort of state where he has to tell them 21 days in advance. I'm not. So he knows that when he goes down there, they'll probably send that data to the Marshal Service. Uh, the Marshal Service as a national sex offender targeting center. I'm, imagine this big room with dots up there. It's just crazy how out of control we become. But their function is in their agency intelligence and operations for tracking us internationally and also locally. Interpol, of course, Interpol sends out alerts. And I'll go through those real quick in another slide. The biggest one for us is the green notice. Um, and and all, all nations have what's called the National Central Bureau. So when Interpol in Washington, D.C. decides to send a green notice, it goes to the opposite country's um, central, uh, National Central Bureau. That's just the term they use. And from there, they decide to send it on to the immigration in the country, which then sends it on to the, to the airport customs office. Uh, customs and border... Those are the guys that give us, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the, the exams when we get back. Uh, National, Nat National Targeting Center, uh, they just provide some travel information. The biggest player in this whole thing, both from the watch center and from a process center, has turned out to be Immigration, Customs, and Enforcement. They investigate sexual exploitation children from an international point of view and they have become the central agency 
in which they pass the information on and coordinate with the other agencies. And I, I'll, we have all these slides for everyone to, to... Now, this is... I really want to go through this. Can everyone read this with magnifying glasses? Uh, this is the information flow. Um, so basically, there's two ways they're going to get information sent to the nations. They're going, to, they're going to take information from the Marshall Service and send that to the UN, or they're going to take office uh, information from ICE and send that directly to the ICE representatives. What's happening now is I, we know that the Angel Watch Center is also now working with the UN, uh, the uh, United Interpol offices in the individual countries through the Washington, D.C. area. So that's how if you don't fit under Adam Walsh and you don't do the 21-day notification, uh, you still may get notifications sent to the country you're arriving at who don't have an ICE office because the Angel Watch office now they know that there's not an ICE representative there. They send a notice to Interpol, then Interpol follows that up, if that makes sense. Now, can you guys read this chart? Yeah, yeah okay, all right. And, and it kind of gives you an understanding of the architecture. So you go down, you tell them you're leaving, that information may go to the Marshal Service. Then the Marshal Service may send it on to Interpol. And then when you book your flight, that's why if you want to go to Mexico, for example, at the moment, the best way to do is just go down to San Diego, El Dorado, cross the border, get your passport stamped. Because if they don't have a notice, they don't, they're going to scan your passport and not, not have any criminal information on you. It's the notice that gets to them that flags you. So if you cross the border, and, and even if you, mar the Marshal Service knows, they're not sending it on to the border agencies, or the nation's not sending it on the board, board agencies. All the data is getting to the airports. So if you can travel to other countries without going through airports, that's tough. That's one way, at least for now, to travel unmolested. The problem is, and this is just like everything, and this is one of, one of my peeves I would say that we need to focus on, is, and that is smart people who want to do something bad figure out a way, figures out a way around it, and they figure out vulnerabilities. So people, yeah, go ahead. I'm curious about cruise lines. So if sure. You, if it's just airports, can you take cruise to these? Lines? There's at the moment, there's not a problem with cruise lines. None. Sure. Oh. <laughs> well. Uh, Royal, Royal Caribbean says no. Yeah. I have a client who got denied two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, Royal Caribbean says no. Yeah. Uh, right. I travel to Royal Caribbean without a problem. So right. Right. Well, okay, that, it might be, I've traveled, I haven't traveled Royal Caribbean, I've traveled out of Florida many times on two different ones, I can't remember which ones, uh, and I've had no problem. At the, at the, so, that's, you see, at the end of this, I want to start getting data, I want a database where good and bad experiences will have date, time, details, and I want to make it searchable so people can go online, download the database, and look at individual circumstances, and understand you know, what happened in that circumstance and capture it. Um, I think at the time that there was a, um, there was like a nationwide press about crimes happening on board ships. Right. And I think he got caught in that right. time frame. Right. I don't know when you were allowed to go on, and I have to go back and check my records about when he was denied, but he got it in writing. You cannot go because you're on the registry. And they were refusing to pay him any of his money back. They paid him everything. Right. Good. Oh, good. good. That document you'd like to have. Yeah, well, we want to have that document. Yeah. I've uh, I've I've traveled uh, cr not Royal. What's some of the other ones? Carnival. I go Carnival all the time. And, and and the last two times I've come back in port, the Carnival security people pulled me aside and they say, you know, Customs wants you over here, and I knew why. And I had suspicion that Carnival understood, but. They didn't give me any grief. You know, I went, I had my colonoscopy done, and then I went on my way. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, the, this was strange. The last time I went, this guy was very apologetic. He said, you know, we have to do this. Uh, then he said something which I already know. You could expect this forever. I said, yeah, I know. That's the customs guy. And then he says, uh, he looks at, I have my computer and my bags, and he goes, oh, let me see your phone. He undid my phone. He wrote down some 
you know, information on the back of the phone underneath the battery, like he had to do something. He says, uh, yeah, I have to look at something. And he put it back and he gave it back and he let, let me on my way. You know, and I, I have no idea why. I, I, the way he acted is, he, he, oh, there's a guy coming in, he's an SO, you have to examine something. So he, he examined my, he didn't even look at the interior. Go ahead. I was curious about when that was. Uh, that was last uh, year around November. Yeah, I travel cruise lines all the time. I've never had a single problem. Even when you go to port entry, not a single problem. Again, there's, it's the data getting directly to the border control people with a really rude message, which is the problem. But that's a good, now I was, I think it was, I was crew, I was traveled on Carnival, and that, I know the message, there was a, a re, news report that came out that talked about people on ship, there was a guy who was an employee of a of company who raped someone on a ship. And it, the, it, the subject of the article was sex offenders traveling. Now it wasn't targeted at sex offenders registered, it was targeted at people who are on ships and commit sex acts. Okay, but that highlighted that, so that might have been that just that information. Because really the big thing is when you book things, these, they're not doing background checks on you and that would be a hard thing for them to do individually. So somehow they found out he was on the registry. That's the question. How did they find that information out? You know, yeah, yeah. That the, was their policy. Right, 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 yeah, they, right. Well, how do they know though? They do background checks. Last uh, time I went, I went with a family of my, my ex-wife and her husband, my daughter uh -huh. and her husband, the grandkids. And the only one that had a problem was my daughter, my son-in-law, who's a Venezuelan national. And his background check took an extra week or two. My background check came back with everybody else with no problem. And huh. when, I, when I went on, they knew who I was. They knew I was a registered sex offender. And that was just a normal cruise? Yeah, that was okay. just a normal cruise down to Mexico. And okay, right, right, right. Honduras. So they do background checks on everyone boarding the ship? Yeah, and they did it a month before the... Oh, how do you know that? Well, we got a letter saying your background check has been approved. Really? Oh, okay. I've never gotten anything. I just booked the booked it and went and. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, so, so right now, you know, so now we having conflicted information. That's one reason why I wanted to have this this what, meeting. What I was told is that they're looking for people who are on the run. Who oh, right, right, right. I see. Right, 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 right. Well, what they could notice is they could just might check watch lists. Or uh, other, you know, like Interpol has the red notices, et cetera. Because doing a, a background check, you know, is on 4,000 people would be logistically a challenge. But, you know, I'd like to break that nut, though, figure out how they're doing that. Okay, uh, real quick. Uh, oh, next. Interpol notices. These, I'm not going to go through these, but the main, main ones are the, the green notice is what affects us. Um, and what's really, we got to challenge this because this says a person's criminal activity says the person is considered to be a possible threat to public safety. What are criteria are they using that? Because they're violating our human rights, but just arbitrarily standing out a green notice saying that this person is good, likely to commit a crime in your country. What basis is that? Because one of the things that the new law is, this is interesting. So if, if the watch office believes that you're a threat of commi committing an act overseas, they're going to send a notice. But if you're under investigation, they won't send a notice. Because obviously that could screw up the investigation. So if you're actually a threat, they're going to send a notice. But if you're not a threat, I mean, they won't send a notice. But if you are, aren't a threat, they will send a notice. And the other question is, I've gotten to the country where they turn me away because they obviously have no clue really what the message, what my threat level is. And I get back here and they're like, I was in Fort Lauderdale. And I, I was going through Panama City trying to get to Jamaica, and they sent me back. I get to Fort Lauderdale, and the guy says, oh, yeah, yeah, we had another guy turn back around. And he looks at my bags. He doesn't even look at anything. He says, oh, you can go on. So wait a minute. The watch office sent a message saying that this guy's a threat. First of all, I'm transiting through the airport. So I, how can I be a threat? If I'm a threat, why aren't you going through my bags when I get back to the country? Why aren't you going through my computer? You've done it before when I was kicked out of the Philippines. Um, why aren't, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. But of course, that's the border control agency. This is Angel Watch. So the Angel Watch is sending messages based just upon, they're not inspected, they're just sending them. They're not going through any process. So there's a due process issue there too, as far as I'm concerned. And you guys can, there, 
the things that might affect us is red notice. If you, if you have a red notice, I think you have other problems. Uh, this, I just thought this was in, in, next. This is interesting. This is uh, how one, I couldn't find any blue, green notices online, and I'm sure some people have it. So we got to get copies of those. This is Julia Assange's uh, um, red notice for sexual, uh, you know, he didn't he did actually commit a sex crime. Uh, he was investigated for, for other stuff that he did with two consenting adults. But um, this is just what it looks like. It's kind of interesting. And on this, under the offense, uh, my understanding is that Green Notice is saying this individual is likely to commit a crime in your country. Uh, what, what are you basing that criteria on? Is, I mean, is that not sure. enough to possibly lock someone up in a third world country that has maybe a crazy law? You know? like we sure, can, yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it's very scary. It's very scary. It's very scary. And the U.S. won't protect this if that happens? <laughs> Probably. Uh, no. Yeah, there's the one setting the notice. So this is a green notice. That's a, that's, a, that's a red notice. Yeah, now red notice is basically... Um, yeah, exactly. We, we need this guy arrested and, and, and uh, extra, extradite him. Okay, i go next. Okay, here's some of the country... What? Oh yeah, right, right. Okay, these are countries that I'm sure the list is longer, but I'd just like to run through this real quick. Some some countries they do get the notice, but what's complicated is that they now have specific laws barring us from entry. So, like for the example, the Philippines has stated anyone on any registry anywhere in the world, if they're notified by their country that they're on the registry, then they're barred from entering the Philippines. That's the policy right now. Now that's not one written in law, it's one stated by the head of immigration. Uh, but, th but they do have a law against moral turpitude which allows them to kick you out if, if you committed a crime against moral turpitude. Now what does that mean? I don't know. So um, Mexico, I think we're all aware of what the problems are having with Mexico. Brazil, they had, when, they had the, um, uh, when they had the World Cup, they were just real concerned about exploitation and and uh, terrorism, they passed a law specifically banning child sex offenders from entering Brazil, uh, which is now a challenge. Argentina also has a law. Panama, you can't even transit through the country. Now, what's interesting about Panama is you can go through Panama in a bus and not have a single problem at all, at least right now. Um, and then fly back. I know of two people have done that, fly back internationally. Again, it's all down to whether they get the notice or not. Sure, go ahead. Correct, correct, correct. Now there are countries like Canada where they pull directly from access to a criminal database. U United Kingdom and Canada both have direct access to uh, American criminal records. Uh, so in that regard, uh, that creates challenge for those two countries. Um, that's only going to expand though, likely, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that's. Go ahead. Is that for Canada. So very good question. Very good question. Right. Uh, it's Vancouver. Uh huh. You're going to drive through. Right. Is that the issue, or only if you fly in and out? It, definitely, if you fly in and out. I believe they are doing it at the. They do. I know people have crossed the border on with the car with a, with his wife and had no problem uh, in near Vancouver. But these again, this is just anecdotal inferences. Uh, one guy going to Montreal by train was was put on train going back. Uh, at the when they checked at the train at the train station at the, at the border control, so Canada right now their policy is if you have almost any type of criminal um, background at the border they won't let you in unless you get a letter of rehabilitation, which is expensive and long process. Uh, but there are there's anecdotal information that people have gone to some areas on the border and were able to cross without a problem to Canada. But again, that's like third party information which I can't validate. And that's one reason why we need to fix that by having a database where we just, what are the facts? Yeah. What is a letter of um, But um, Canada has a process where if you've, 
whatever, depending on what your fence might be, you can apply for a uh, certification that you've been rehabilitated. They have a process. Uh, it costs quite a bit of money. Uh, and I'm sure some other people can speak to that process. And even there are some sex offenders where, sex offenses, where you may be able to be authorized that you've been rehabilitated. It basically, it's, you, you no longer committed other crimes. You've been free of crime for X number of years. You've been, had counseling, and then you work with, uh, with their customs or with uh, their immigration to go through a process and documentation, pay fees to get that stamped, uh, get a letter and then you can get a visa to enter Canada. And then you can go to Canada for some period of time. And the website, can any website has very detailed information on that? Sure. Go, go ahead, Robert. Well, they have two, two letters. They're ministerial letters, and there's a temporary one time one, and there's a permanent one. And like you say, they're very expensive, and they're, they're onerous to attain. OK, OK, we're good. OK. Yeah, go ahead. When you say uh, the United Kingdom, does that also apply, apply to the islands? Yeah, I went to Ireland without a problem. When I was in Ireland, I, 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 made my, I booked my return ticket. Um, I was with my mom. She went. I stayed for a month. We, and I, it was actually cheaper to go round trip, $800, instead of just going one way. So I booked an 800 round trip ticket, and I went back uh, eight months later. And unfortunately, I didn't think about it. I was going through London. And I thought I went through customs in Ireland. But nope, London. They pulled me. They were right at the airport. No, then they then they sent a message to the guard a in Ireland. They said, well, they're not going to let you in. Well, of course not. You just sent them a message that this nasty guy is trying to get in your country. Who's going to let you in? And then they said, well, we decided we're not going to let you in our country either. So if you want to go to Ireland, you're going to have to apply for a visa, is what the border guy told me. The problem is the border people, they don't know crap about the process for visas, and they don't care less. They're sending you home. They're going to do your paperwork and send you home. So right now, uh, yeah, UK, you're not going to get in. By, and stuff like that. Well, well let, let, yeah, let me address that. Um, I think I had no problem in Ireland. I think I might have one now, but Ireland you may not have a problem with. I would think if you go to the American Virgin Islands and take a ferry over the British Virgin Islands, you won't have a problem. Go ahead. Well, I just went yeah. through the official visa process for the UK and Scotland. Uh huh. It was, it was denied. Was it? Okay. The decision was basically you coming here, there's nothing that you're going to do here that's going to outweigh the public risk, so we can't in good faith. Okay, right, 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 right. Okay, well, well, yeah. So uh, the official answer is you can't even get a visa if you want to. You right. You through the whole documentation, right. all the biometrics and everything. Right, 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 right. My whole life's history, how much money I made, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's crazy. Michael, Michael, Michael Jackson, Michael, uh, Mike Tyson tried to go to the UK to do a book. He was told... And I went to the, I went to the website, the, the UK government website. Technically, if you have an offense that was greater than 30 months in jail, then they can deny your visa. If it's less than 30 months, then they can give you a visa. But they still can deny. How long was your sentence? Just out of curiosity. Probation was four years probation. Okay, well, that's, that's the sentence they, they use, whatever your sentence was, whether you spend any time incarcerated or not. Um, at least that's what the website said, 30 months. Um, I don't know if they, I, I think they can still, they'll just deny you retroactively because you're an SO, uh, because you're at public risk. Yeah, Robert? Well, it just, it's part of the five eyes countries. Yeah, right, 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 yeah. And they, they share all U.S. databases. Right, right. So you New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. Right, exactly. And yeah, you mentioned uh, in, in all, all intelligence stuff, we, Australia, although, although for some reason the rich white countries, I, don't, I mean, they're the toughest on the, on the enforcement and getting into it and sharing of databases. Now, here's an interesting question. What if you flew to France, took a ferry over to Ireland, and then took a ferry to England? That's the question. I don't know. Now, I think the database would be there, but, but if you go by ferry and they don't pull that uh, passenger information, they're not going to get alert. Go ahead. I think the question would be, are you breaking the law by doing that? How are we breaking the law? It's up to them to apply the law. I mean, you can't understand what the law is. You're traveling on your passport. You're fully documented. It's up to them to enforce the law. Now, the worst thing happens is you get to the country, you're in the country. They find out. They track you down, arrest you, and deport you. That's all that's going to happen. It's not against the law of the United States. Yeah, yeah. They, I, I, 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's excellent. Excellent. There. Sinjin nations. There are nations all over Europe, all the way to the Ukraine, not including Russia, and all the way to like uh, uh, Romania. They have signed a treaty that anyone once they're in one of those countries, basically Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, you can travel as as you want for 90 days. So one objective is to get to like, hey, could you talk about Belgium? You, you travel a lot. What's your name again? Mac. Mac. I'll tell you what, let's, let me get through this real quick and then let's talk about that. That'll be the first agenda. Uh, so, okay, UK, Canada, Japan, Australia, Japan, I don't think you're able to get in. Some people have gotten into Japan. Uh, Australia, there's a guy who got a student visa for a year to study in, Japan, in Australia and he was a child sex offender. It caused a little bit of stir, but he did it. Uh, Costa Rica is just a country that got rejected some people. I heard Belize right now is not a problem. Uh, but then I, I saw that one person got rejected from Belize. So some of the Latin American countries, I think it's on a one by one basis. It depends on the mood of, of the border agent at the time. China, there was a guy who was living in China got ejected. But I think um, in the question and answers, I'll ask you to talk about China. Uh, Thailand, that's really depressing because in Thailand, in one of the blogs, as questions were asked by a British sex offender, and the assistant chief of immigration answered the question. He was a British sex offender, and he said, can I travel in your country? And the immigration officer said there's no specific law barring sex offenders or other offenders uh, from barring. We won't let you in if you committed a crime in Thailand, or if you're on a red notice, or you're on a, a, a watch list of any kind. But other than that, as long as you're here for 30, no more than 30 days, you can travel. But then he said, getting a visa may be a difficult because then we, need, we will understand your background. However, there is a guy that got ejected from Thailand, same guy that went to China, uh, and he has a very interesting story on the California blog. I would, and Janice would probably speak a little bit more about it. I read in detail, very interesting. So let, let's uh, go to the next one. Okay, I want to cover this action plan. I want to develop a team, and we'll talk about that after we do the question and answers. Um, I want to have a website. Whatever we do, I would like to see it coordinated as a tab under NS, NRSOL, if possible. Um, I want a travel experience database, two things. I want a database, good and bad, of what's your experiences that you traveled, and we stick with the facts, date, time, specifics, exactly what happened, so we don't have to have anecdotal information. Then I want another database of family members. What effect has this had on families? Detailed information. You know, weddings have been destroyed. Families have been harmed. We, I want to capture this data and get it in form, and even if we have to have signed affidavits or whatever, I want, I want a, a facts, informational thing that we can present uh, legislative or whatever we have to do, but I want to get that data so we have it and we update it on a regular basis and people can go to it and review it. Uh, and then um, I, the team will start working on some FOIA requests. I want to see forms. I want to see process. Uh, I want to see how they're doing it and any data we can get from the government through the FOA process. Um, Get, start getting some legal resources. You know, I'm willing to put in a little bit of bucks. We can have a, a fund that's set aside to deal with this. Start accumulating some funds. And as we need some resources, we'll have some funds to address it. And then document family experiences. And then, then the team get together and develop an action plan. Now, I'm, I'm not confident we can do anything about it, to be honest with you. But we're tired of sitting and doing nothing. So we're at least going to do something. If I can get in front of congressmen saying, why are, you, why are you letting this angel watch destroy the lives of some of your constituents? Let the congressman say on the record he doesn't care. And get that documented. At least get that documented. And stand up and say, we're going to not just go to Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. But it's also an international commerce issue. Well, there's all kinds of issues. And that's why I want to get developed in the action plan. Yeah. Um, so now what I want to do, let's talk about uh, some things. Uh, what time is it? Thir okay, can you talk about the Shangwei countries? Okay. okay, go ahead. I have a question. Sure. A little bit off topic, topic but not. Uh, what about uh, a country that may accept a registrant and maybe become an expatriate? 
Uh, good luck. But I, I mean, I, I think over time, there's some, a lot of information, and uh, Matt can talk about this. Some people have worked within the country to allow themselves individually to live there. And there's, I, who's, is the guy who has the Filipino wife, he just told me today now he can go back to the Philippines and travel without problem and actually live there. So I think there's a great possibility of that. You know, I'd like to see maybe we, if she can travel with a passport from another country. There's, um, is, uh, there's a guy from Florida who has a Canadian passport. There's people who have Mexican passports. That's on turn. But for the general population, we want to get an action plan. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay, first I want to say that I was very naive on this issue, and I thought that we Americans have a constitutional right to travel abroad. We don't. Okay, so the weird thing is we have a constitutional right to travel in our own state and also to other states. But the historical research shows there is no constitutional right to international travel. And uh, there's a real checkered past here in our country. So at one time, Arthur Miller, the author and playwright, he was denied a passport. Another time, a, ch a justice of our U.S. Supreme Court, William O. Douglas, was denied a passport. And it was explained then that, and it has not changed, that there is no constitutional right to international travel. So I just let everybody know that's the kind of the altitude of this mountain we have to climb, but it's certainly worth climbing. So if you hold just one second, I, the one information I want to pass out, because this is really, really important, I only learned it about a month ago. There are 26 European nations, they're called the Schengen nations. So it's S-C-H-E-N-G-E-N. Whatever that means, in whatever language, Schengen nations, there are 26 of them. You can enter those countries. And then you can travel from there. Okay? And I know Germany is one of those countries. And so go to Germany. And there's buses and there's trains and there's planes. Also about going to Mexico. So, I mean, I'm from California and a lot of people think they want to go to Mexico. Well, if you want to go to Mexico, travel across the border. You can go by bus and you can walk across the border and trolley <laughs> right <laughs> whatever yes yeah, like um, the tunnels on the, uh, and once you get we, to mexico we'll share it with the cartels <laughs> so once you get to mexico then you can book travel when, once you get across the border okay or even ahead of time because I, what happens is our government who's looking right. at the flight manifest okay and then they're sending notices like paul was saying to the country saying this dangerous person wants to come and visit your nation right and god only knows what that person's going to do once they get there so that's that's a really big problem I have a comment. And what we have to do is think of more creative ways of how to get around them. My only concern about putting some of this stuff on a blog on our website is that other people are reading them too. So when we find loopholes, then they start right. closing those loopholes. So I don't know how we address that. I'm I, not an expert on that. I think what we should do is not enter the loopholes on the blogs. Have that in a database that we only have access to that you log into. And it probably should be centered, we'll just give so many loggable, go ahead. Exactly, exactly. Because if we said, hey, let's go, go, go down to San Diego and cross over to Tijuana, trust me, someone's gonna try to shut that down. Right. And the Mexicans won't appreciate either. Right. Let me say one thing about, about traveling internationally once you get to another country. I was, this surprised the heck out of me. I was in the Dominican Republic trying to get to Jamaica, and I just wasn't thinking. I booked my flight on Copa Airlines, and I, I saw the thing, Panama City. Stupid me, I was thinking, oh, I'm going through Florida? What the heck? I land in Panama City, and oh, my phone's not working. Oh, this is not uh, Panama City. Oh, it's Panama City, Panama. And I, and I was ejected from there. But what's really chilling is I booked my flight on an international flight from an international country to another international country. So let's say you go to, let's say you go to Monterey and you want to fly to, you know, Venezuela, uh, and it still can be searchable. It sounds like, you know. So the idea is to fly internally in Mexico and then cross the border to another country and then travel internally. Uh, don't try to travel internationally across the border by airline through any countries. I don't know, maybe, like for example, if, you're, if you do get to England, you fly out of London and you go into Russia, 
that you're probably going to be flagged, is my point. Mm -hmm. so, and my understanding, too, is once you get one of those green notices from Interpol, then almost all, I think all countries are off limits to you. So you get that green notice, and that does not mean go. Uh -huh. <laughs> that means you are not going. And, and I mean, really, part of the terrible part of this, and, and Paul, you mentioned it in passing, but I think it's worth repeating, is that they don't tell you ahead of time. So you've just spent all of your money, <laughs> You spent all of your time to get there, and oh, by the way, your loved ones too. I have somebody who contacted me recently who bought his, you know, the extended family. Everybody's going to the United Arab Emirates. I mean, he's, that's his heritage. And he was so proud of his family, and he couldn't wait, you know, wait to reunite with all the distant relatives. Well, he got stopped at the border. And the question was, would his family go on? And he said he wanted his family to go on, and he came back to the States. Okay, but I have another client. He went to Japan with his wife, who is a Japanese citizen. They were going there to buy a house in Japan. He was stopped at the border and deported. So he spent the night in the airport. The next fl first flight out, he left and had to go back to the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you yeah, get to pay for that. Well, well when when you when you ejected, at least from my experience is they just put you on the airline. And I guess the airline absorbs the cost. No one, you don't pay for that, but you've lost all the money that you put down on your trip. I mean, you have you bought a round trip ticket, so I, the, my interpretation, you paid for it. It may be a different flight than you paid for it, but yeah, you paid for it. But Japan is all felons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Japan is is almost impossible. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's why we need to get a database which we stick with the fact. I'm not saying it's not true. It could be true. I'm just saying, and we don't know the circumstances either. You know, one, like Jamaica let me in. A lot of, one, because the, she didn't think my, what I did was that bad. Uh, so we don't know what the specific circumstances is. That does surprise me, though, because I know a guy went to Milan and tried to find a place, police department, to say to register. I don't know what we, and they looked at him like he was an idiot. We don't care. So that, that's an interesting, so we need to get that database. But, and again, uh, I think it goes to the issue that any immigration officer in any country can reject anybody right. for any reason at any time. Correct, so. correct. So it, one thing, it's a highlighted issue. Now I do want to, my understanding is the green notice goes to that particular country. I might be wrong. I, I uh, told once you get a green notice probably. that you get a green notice. I also want to mention Grenada. If anybody wants to go visit Grenada, you can go to Grenada. And, right, yeah. <laughs> and I had somebody contact me. He was going there for a job interview, and he actually oh. got the job. So now oh, he's great. going to be a professor in Grenada. And um, I tracked it down to, like, their U.S. Department of Justice, the equivalent, and I talked to a B person, right? And he was apologizing they didn't have a law. And I said, no need to apologize to me. And right. uh, you don't need any of those stinking laws yes right 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 but one thing we don't want to do is start traveling to one single country um, oh my god yeah you know. let's have a convention and there one, yeah let's have a convention in Aruba holy shit <laughs> yeah you talking about cruises that's why we Yeah, that's right, right, right. And Some, and, yeah, and, it's a lot of money on fourth. I mean, I just don't see them yeah. doing it. And besides that, it's probably in the fine print somewhere that you sign <laughs> when you buy your ticket. I don't read it either. Is there any benefit to buying your ticket maybe a week before you leave? So maybe it, it seems to me like I travel spirit. I, I I'm thinking about I'll go to Florida, spend a couple of days in Fort Lauderdale, and then buy a ticket the day I'm going to go. But doesn't that tag you? Don't, don't, well, well I, mi I accidentally misspelled my name once, and I know I wasn't flagged. The problem is you get flagged when you scan the passport as you board the airplane. So that's what happened to me going to the UK. So that's an eight-hour flight. Well, if it's only a two-hour flight, maybe there's not enough time to flag you. But we got to get away from, you know, what do we do? What, what ways around it? We, we need to attack it is what we need to do. Now, let's... Um, um, 
Which, I'm, yeah. yeah, there's a Hi, researcher. I'm Pam. Right. I'm not even scheduled to be talking. I'm the kind of unofficial researcher for the California RSOL, and I just troll Google because I have nothing else to do and find problems to try to solve. Um, is anybody here from Utah? Okay, so you... Utah has this AG, uh, Reyes, Sean Reyes, who has decided that he's a cowboy. And he's gone down on a raid to Columbia or something and freed sex slaves of some sort. And he's, yeah, oh, big man. So he was called to testify in front of Congress. And I found out that he had done this. And there was a big documentary about it. And he had been called to testify in front of Congress. And so I went and I looked at his testimony. And I took all of his testimony that he said. And then I went down and I tracked down all of his sources. And none of his sources checked out. His sources were actually quoting, there's 20 to 30 million human trafficked people, and of that, 80% are sex slaves, and of that, 80% are child sex slaves. Oh, none of this is true. I tell you this because that's what he's telling them. I can also tell you if you go to the congressional record and just read it because it's available to you, that once that crew got out of there, the new crew came in, the serious crew, and they were not as interested in you guys at all. They are not, their focus is not on the sex industry. They do not see this as the problem in the human trafficking. They see human trafficking and the problems that are being caused by it from people who are being exploited by, I will, you will pay me this much money to get here and then you'll just pay it back and then they can never pay it back. So indentured servitude kinds of situations or situations where, say, women are offered jobs in the United States and then they're not paid anything but they get to stay in the United States in a house but they don't have any money, they can't go anywhere, they can't get ahead, they're stuck. That kind of human trafficking is really what the serious people were interested in discussing. And it did look to me, in reading through the record, that our senators understood the difference, that they know that what was being said by this cowboy is not real. If you want to know what the real number is, it's out of 20 million, four and a half million or so are expected to be in the realm of sex slaves, I guess you would call them. Of that number, almost 90% are over 18. So we're talking about less than 100,000 children, which is still too many. I'm not trying to say it's not. It's way too many. But 100,000 versus what he's giving them, which is 16 million, is a really big difference. I can tell you, it looked to me like the Senate was not buying it. And there's no guarantee this thing is going to pass. He's been driving for five years. When right, I called right. his office, they couldn't tell me where it was in committee. His right. own office people didn't know where it was in committee. Right. So right. I don't think we should... I don't think we shouldn't do anything. And anybody who has any contacts in Utah, if you can write editorials about what this guy is claiming is true and what is actually true, I think that's powerful. So... Excellent. I mean, that's really excellent news. So, hopefully, oh, yeah. Ten minutes. Well, I'll make it just three or four. I really want to wrap up. Uh, if that's true, then what we need to do is have a process where we attack the process. And we say, look, because the mandate of the Angel Watch is to examine it, make a determination, and then make a decision. Are we going to notify the other country or not? Well, they're not doing that. They're not doing that at all. And I would say, at least do your freaking job. Now, I don't think we should be molested at all. If we're already done, done our time, we're off paper, we're not doing anything wrong. And the argument is, you, we're telling them when we're leaving. You guys are, you have every chance to examine us when we come in. And half the time now, at least in Dallas, I'm not even bothered. He goes, yeah, all right, fine, and I go on. Uh, so why are you doing this? So that's where we need to attack. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, can we sp spend... Anyone interested in being on the action team, maybe? Uh, let's meet. Can we talk after this and then have another more formal meeting later on this afternoon? Would that be possible? 
Uh, and you know, I, I could care less about attribution. I want to see this happen, and 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 I'm pretty vigorous. Um, so I, you know, I'm happy to lead. I don't know if we need a leader, but we need a team, and let's get that team identified, and then we can figure out the process after after that. Uh, so right after this, and and any more questions? Could, if, sure. If the law passes, could it be shown that it's punitive and can't? Apply. Sure, I think through through uh, due process and all that, it's, it's definitely punitive. Yeah. Um, One of the big issues but, that if the law passes that was addressed is the limitation of duration of passport. It'll be limited to one year. Well, that that actually passed, and that was under a separate bill that had a poor, that was appropriating money for, and and that's actually something we need to examine. There was a there was a part of a State Department appropriations that allows the states it allows the Secretary of State to limit the duration of some sex offender passports to as little as a year if he determines that has to happen. Well, that's vague. That, that, that's completely vague. And what, why, I mean, that's a complete violation of due process. Uh, now, my feeling is make it five, four, even four years, who cares? But one year, the problem is you get to a country, and a lot of times they won't let you in your country, is your passport is not good for another six months. So what, I only travel for six months out of the year, and then I come back, renew it, and then i got to get it on the road because in six months my passport's no good. That's ridiculous. So that was passed as part of the appropriation. We have to track down, is it being, what did the State Department do with that? It's vague, and it gives no guidance to what the Secretary of State's supposed to do. It just states, it authorizes him, if, they, if he or she decides, to limit SO's passport to one year. What the heck does that mean? One good thing about this law is that, according to the process, is if by the SORNA law uh, you, you can be off registration, they're not supposed to apply the notification. So, for example, I'm lifetime in Texas, but by Adam Walsh, I'm 10 years. So, supposedly by this law, in just five and a half years, they're supposed to cease officially notifying uh, other, other nations. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 anyway. So so but I think it's bet if it if this doesn't pass, I then think it's definitely a plus. Move to Maryland. Well, yeah, yeah. And that then the Maryland legislature go, "What the hell? We we have we have two <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 It actually be a safer place. Any more questions? Yeah, well, just one more. Yeah. Oh yeah, it does. It does. As a matter of fact, hey, can you speak speak to that, uh, no, really. Ronnie? Oh, come on, come on. No. Ronnie, Ronnie's a lawyer, uh, ex lawyer from Florida, and uh, you know, well, I can't speak to it. Like, I, he came up with some excellent um, uh, legal statements as to what rights are being violated. And the problem is, I can't say it as eloquently as he can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, you don't want to talk. Guy doesn't shut up while we're dinner, but. <laughs> yeah, if anybody wants to see a, the federal marshal's form. Okay, and, and I want that part of our process, too. Okay, let's terminate this and let's all guys chat, guys and gals chat here want to be part of the team. And give me an applause. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs>